Lord with you today. You brighten up my life, and I pray that we are all encouraged and uh, edified by what uh, we are going to experience here today. I want to thank our regular organist, Devin Rosencraft, for being here uh, at our side. He has been away much of the summer, but we're very glad that he is back with us. Uh, he jokingly said to me via text, I hope they don't make, a, make me sign the guest book on the way in. But you always have a seat there whenever you want it, dear brother. We are so appreciative. Thank you for sharing your gift to elevating our hearts to God's Thanks to everybody who is continuing to help us in our careful uh, continuation of worshiping in the sanctuary. We are so thankful that in the last week or two it looked like COVID trends are coming down again here in Orange County. But as we know, we keep thinking and hoping and wanting to be done with it, but it is not necessarily done with us. So we do encourage everybody, regardless of vaccination status, to please do wear a mask in the sanctuary. I'm happy to do my part. Some folks have asked from the pulpit we do take it off because it muffles the, uh, the auditory part of it, but I just want you to know that I'm in it with you guys. Um, we are still working on getting back to 100%. We're thankful for some steps of progress. The Kids Sabbath School is now indoors over in the youth room. Here is a big forward step. We are re-initiating the church choir. How many can say amen to that? Amen. amen. Last week, Mirta Lice herself was here to gather some interests for people who might like to sing in the church choir, but we recognize not everybody was here last week, myself included. So if you did not get one of these handouts, but you're interested in being in the church choir, first rehearsal is this Thursday night, I believe 7 o'clock. This Thursday is going to be the first rehearsal. And so grab one of these on the way out. I'll put them by the uh, bulletins there. And so please let us know your contact info because we want to get a nice chorus going to sing here once or twice a month. Won't that be an enhancement to our worship service? Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Looking so forward to that. Also today we are having sign-ups for our afternoon kids clubs. This is another step forward in our returning to normal. The Pathfinder and Adventurer Clubs are coming back in person after more than a year of not meeting. And so uh, Brother Margarito is in charge of the Adventurers and Sister Alicia is in charge of the Adventurers. I believe they're both here today. We're going to have a sign-up table on the courtyard afterwards. So if you have any kids, let's see, Adventurers is ages 3 through 10, I believe. And then Pathfinders is grade 5 through high school. So we'd love to sign you up. We're going to start that again. The last Sabbath of the month is going to be the first week uh, that we have our afternoon kids club. I wanted to see 3.30 is the time that it meets. It's, that, that, uh, that detail is rusty in my brain, so don't quote me on 3.30. But it's definitely happening. Next week, we have the next outing from our outdoors club. Uh, I thought we were going to call Joanne and Mia forward. Mia, do you want to come forward? No? Joanne had asked me about coming forward, but I don't see her. Anyway, next Sabbath, the Outdoor Club is taking a hike at Dana Point. So they're going to meet at 2 o'clock, and the meeting place is going to be in front of the Ocean Institute. So bring a lunch, bring some water, bring some snacks. You're going to be staying out there until sunset time. Uh, you can also, if you want, bring a beach umbrella and a chair. We're going to have a lovely time out there. Uh, we've got our regular Wednesday events going on. Our food bank distribution is at 5 o'clock. Thank you to all the volunteers who do a wonderful job collecting and organizing and distributing that food. We could not do it without dozens of hours that are contributed by several people. And also we have Wednesday night prayer group, which, inv which involves some period of unhurried prayer, followed by going through our Bible chapters of Read Through the Bible 2021. You may remember since January, we have been reading through the Bible. We have now combined that with our Wednesday evening prayer group that we discuss those. And if you're not able to come Wednesday at 6, either in person or on Zoom, you can always look on our church YouTube channel. The discussions on those chapters is posted on YouTube usually a day or so after. We've also got previous weeks sermons and church services on the YouTube channel. Joanne, do you still want to come forward? Okay, I probably didn't do your announcement justice. So you do or don't want to come forward? Come forward, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, while she is doing the announcement, uh, anybody who would like a form about being in the choir, raise your hand and we'll get you one of these while they make their announcement in the outdoors. Anybody for the choir? Making sure the pictures were um, delivered to um, to the we're having some technical issues with pictures, so that's why I ran up there with the pastor was before he started talking. And I'm like I was trying to run down the stairs to um, get here in time. So as the pastor mentioned, we are next week going to be going to um, what's the Dana Point Caves, and last weekend Yvette and I actually 
went there to check it out to make sure it was worthy for everybody else. Aww. And it is quite the adventure. We do have some pictures when they're ready, go ahead and put them up, of what it looks like. Um, it's a little, it's interesting because we're hiking along the, the beach. It's a very rocky trail, and I kept thinking, when are we going to get there? And when we finally arrived, it was very spectacular. And um, what did you think about the event? Um, no, it was very fun. Um, wow. The, the trail, like, I, like she said, it is rocky. So um, we do have to watch your step all the way through until we get to the cave. You do get wet as we're going into the cave. Um, but it's beautiful. It's not that long. So I you know any of you guys can do it. I think it's about a few miles total round trip. So, um, so it's really nice. Parking is free. So. We're going to have flyers built next week. You can see how it's rocking along there. So, but definitely wear sturdy shoes. And, um, when, and, and there's tight holes in there that are really nice. So there's a lot to do on your way. But, um, the event was saying it's not a long hike, but it's a very interesting hike. There's a lot going on. It starts out sandy, and then we go out and go around that big rock that you see at the end, and then that's where you start kind of going along. And, what we're meeting earlier than normal this time because of the, the tide, because the high tide is like seven feet, um, like maybe eight o'clock in the night. So we want to go where the low tide is, otherwise you may not be able to make it because you know it comes up. And the, the part I would say you might you might get wet because there was a part going into the cave where it was like this dip and it was filled with water, which came up about to about to my knees. So you're gonna have to get wet. So whatever you wear on your feet has to be shoes don't mind getting wet. And I say might because the tide might be low enough that it's not a problem. And right next to the one cave, there is a second cave that depending on if the tide is low, you can walk over. When we were there, we probably like that three feet. And people were actually bathing in it, and the water was like up here, and the waves were pushing them. So it just depends. It's just on the, like, to the right side, there's another cave similar to that. So depending on the tide, um, how it is, yeah, yeah. and on how wet you might or not get. So that's just what you would, you know. And if you don't want to do the rocky part, there's a lot of like smooth area, like around the marina and everything. We're actually meeting at the Ocean Institute. So yeah, we highly recommend you to come. Bring a lunch because we may um, see the, the red tide in Dana Point. It might be there. So after night, it's a, it's a beautiful, um, light show. So if you haven't seen it before, it's like a fluorescent light every time the, the waves crash. It's like light you can do really see, but it might be there as well. So if you want to stay all the way through the evening, it would be a good thing. That's good. Enjoy this. We'll have flyers next week. Thank you very much, sisters. Yes, much better job than I did. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. We do have a couple more announcements. First of all, an ongoing membership transfer. This is our second reading, so we will vote on it today. Faye Reynolds is transferring to the Lost Area University Church. A while ago, she and her husband and her kids moved over toward Riverside. And so throughout the week, we've been listening. We haven't heard any reasons why we shouldn't grant her membership transfer. So all in favor of Faye Reynolds being transferred to the Lost Area University Church, say yes. yes. Any opposed, say no. All right, it's with a tear in our eye that we approve that membership transfer. We also want to say happy birthday to uh, several of our church members, Anthony Ibarra, who I understand uh, just moved uh, up north, but we want to wish him a happy birthday. If any of you are friends of his online, absolutely wish him a happy birthday from our church. Brandon Carmona, uh, let's see, I think that's a family member of Sister Carmona. Uh, Jim Hughes, who I did see today, happy birthday in a few days to you, Jim, and Gerardo Salto Jr. So if you can see him or know him, please wish him another year of blessing in the Lord's grace. Uh, every Wednesday I send out an email which includes a devotional thought and church prayer list and announcements similar to the announcements that are in the bulletin. But we want you to know ahead of time what's going on in our community each week. We don't want you to come Sabbath morning and be surprised that there's something Sabbath afternoon and oh, I didn't prepare. So if you don't get those Wednesday emails, don't hesitate to text me or email me there for the info on the back. You can even tear off a corner of your bulletin with your email address and just I'll put it in my pocket and make sure you get next week's email. We pray that you are blessed in our service today. 
This, of course, is a significant anniversary day, the 20th anniversary to the day of September 11th, 2001. Often, our opening reading and our opening hymn are uppers, they're full of glory, but today we are recognizing the wound that we all incurred those many years ago, and similarly, the wounds that Jesus incurred in order to free us of our wounds. Amen? And so we'll have our opening reading, which is from uh, Isaiah 53, and then our opening hymn, which is Secret Head Now.
isn't fair in comparison to what you went through here, Jesus. Thank you for having come. You didn't have to. Thank you for having endured the cross. You didn't have to. But out of love, dear Jesus, for your lost grace, whom you do not hesitate to call friends and brothers, we return our thankfulness to today. We pray this service will be pleasing in your sight, dear Heavenly Father. We pray that every aspect will serve to glorify your name. And may we come from this place resolved in our hearts to live for you for this life and eternally into glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
and that you're coming back for us so that we can all walk with you dressed in white. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Say amen if you're there. Amen. 
says here, Someone will ask him, What are these wounds on your hands? They will answer, The wounds I was given at the house of my friends. May the Lord's blessing be added to the hearing, the understanding, and the doing of the We knew about terrorism, 
Terrorism is the philosophy or the movement of trying to get one's way by instilling terror in, you know, fear in the hearts of others. But as the video depicted, what came up afterwards, the resolve, the helpfulness. Thank you, Aaron, for emphasizing the helpfulness. Far more people ran toward the towers of heroism, yes? To go and help. Our country had not known a day like that since probably Pearl Harbor a couple of generations before um, in terms of you know, lives lost, national impact. Um, and we had vague you know, memories of, of Pearl Harbor, but we hadn't sensed it in our bones. We hadn't felt it in the pit of our stomach like we did that day. I remember my parents always talking about remembering the where and the how when they learned about the Kennedy assassination. And I thought, what a strange thing to remember the where and the how. But with this, I remember the exact where and the how. Our worldview was, I don't want to use the word shattered, but it was definitely affected that day, wasn't it? We walked around with a numb feeling, and of course, lots of prayers. And I was glad that in the aftermath, the houses of worship were full of it. Uh, it was definitely a shocking thing, and we definitely needed to turn to God. Um, fear is not the most ideal motivator, and it's not a good motivator in the long term, but it definitely did that in the short term. It seems like we had to get a lot more defensive on a national and societal level. Um, remember we had to deal with Homeland Security, we still have to deal with that in airports. Remember how easy airport security was before 9 election? It's an inconvenience, but it's one that we gladly endure to avoid future scenes similar to that. Yeah. I remember the Patriot Act being passed, uh, pretty liberal freedoms for surveillance, but uh, for the sake of safety, everybody wanted to be safe. And in the ensuing years, we have had Al-Qaeda and ISIS, Iraq and Afghanistan, which have continued to affect our nation. And every family who sends veterans overseas, thank you profoundly to all the families and any veterans we have here present today. A communal wound. 20 years now in the rearview mirror. How are we doing? The wounds that are at once fresh, once seeping and bleeding, they gradually dull and they improve, right? They eventually scar over and they turn into visible memorials, right? With which we tell our stories. If you've ever known people with interesting scars, they love to tell the story of how they got those scars, yes? Because it means you have survived if you can tell the story about the scars. And of course, we now carry this communal scar around with us. In addition to all the personal, individual wounds we acquire, we say we will never forget the principles. First of all, the innocent lives lost, um, the uh, victory of courage over fear and selflessness of those heroes over the cowardice and the terrible motives that motivated those people personal losses and deaths, uh, which rang out far and wide and broad. Of course, on an individual level, we still acquire individual scars and wounds, don't we? Just yesterday afternoon, I heard about two tragic deaths. One, an 11-month-old baby who died in a household accident, and then another one, a decades-long soldier for the Lord, an inspiration to many of us at La Sierra, a woman who spent her life inspiring young people to serve the Lord. And so we're all a mix, right? We're a mix of the national and, and societal wounds and our individual wounds. And in painful times like these, I praise the Lord for the organizing principle of the great controversy. Though this concept of the great controversy doesn't solve our problems, it helps us make sense of them. It helps us categorize them. It helps us understand them in their proper place and perspective. And it also gives us the hope, and I can never emphasize this too much, the hope that there is an end to this mystery. Amen? I think the most depressing thing about Eastern religion and Taoism, that yin-yang, is the idea that good and evil would always live in parallel with each other and swirling around each other. We long for a day in which all evil is vanquished. Amen? And terrible tragedies on the national scale as well as tragedies on the personal scale make us all say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We need an end to this suffering. All of these wounds and scars that we acquire throughout our lives is because of a bigger wound 
that the whole universe experienced well before we were born, before the human race was created. We get glimpses of it in Scripture, not enough to answer all of our questions. I'm going to have a lot of questions when I get to heaven. But we know enough from the Scriptures to know the basic outline. God's greatest created being, His highest angel, became dissatisfied with being only the highest created being. <laughs> and he began to exalt himself in his mind as the greatest and the best, and therefore began to question and undermine God's beauty. You can read passages of the scripture indicating Lucifer's thought process in passages like Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. But the climax of the heavenly controversy and when the wound really broke out in open is revealed in Revelation 12. Revelation 12, 7 says, There was war in heaven, and Satan and his angels fought against God's army. We don't know what kind of weapons were used. It's hard to imagine physical weapons even being used in heaven. Maybe it was just spiritual power? I'm not sure. But Revelation 12's record goes on to say that Satan and his angels were not strong enough to prevail. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. And they were expelled from heaven, fell from their place of glory, Jesus echoes this in Luke 10.18 when he says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And from there, the controversy came to earth. Sin and Satan got its foot at the door from the well-known history of the Garden of Eden. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 3. And from that first entrance of the great controversy into our world has flowed all the misery, the suffering, the pain, the vice, the warfare, the devastation, and the loss. 9-11 is because of the great controversy that happened before. And the cross happened because of the great controversy that happened in heaven before. And the second coming is happening because of the great controversy that started in heaven before. Of course, there are those who deny that there's a great controversy going on at all. There's nothing nefarious going on behind the scenes. Humanity is generally pretty, very good, and things are trending, trending generally very well. These wars, these tragedies, these natural disasters, they're but blips on the generally upward trend of humanity. Optimism is nice. There's probably something in our psychology that needs optimism, but when it doesn't stand up to the observation test and common sense reasoning, it looks very hollow. I'm not trying to say that Christians aren't optimistic, quite the contrary, but rather we put our hope, rather than in a vague term, things someday will improve, we believe in a far more profound solution and a far more thorough and complete solution. Amen? The immense love of God permeates this wretched and sin-sick world that we inhabit. Evidences of God's benevolence are evident in the beauty of nature, in the warmth and acceptance of family love and in healthy romantic love. But the greatest love ever seen in the world has to do with God drawing near, God embracing this world despite its dysfunction, despite its messiness, despite its hopelessness. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Did you notice the word gave there? It didn't say that he lent the world his son. It says he gave the world his son. In a sense, I guess you could say that God lent us Jesus. He did get it back. Although, was it a foregone conclusion that Jesus would succeed? That may be a consideration for another time in another sermon, but I, I read great risk into the plan of salvation, great risk of loss. It's a much bigger giving if there was a chance he wasn't going to get back. But God sent Jesus into this dark and suffering world with immense love and selflessness. That whoever would believe in Him, and you finish the verse with me, would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. And so now there are two possible ends for each and every person. And the contrast is very stark. Perish eternally or live eternally. Which one would you choose today? The answer seems easy, right? 
If I were to give that quiz to a Bible class and my students over at Orangewood, they would easily get an A on it, correct? It's easy to declaratively answer it. It's another thing to live it out day by day, is it not? Praise the Lord. We're not called to do it on our own. God holds our hands and walks with us through every step. Amen? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff come from me. But friends, what did it cost God? What did it cost Jesus to procure that seemingly easy choice for us? That cost was unfathomably high for him, was it not? We've already been affirming today just what bringing salvation to us caused Jesus. In our responsive reading of Isaiah 53, and in our opening hymn of O Sacred Head Now Wounded, we saw that Jesus' wounds, voluntarily endured and undertaken, are the source for our healing. I praise the Lord for those heroes that ran into the towers that day. Many of them died. Amen. Jesus ran into a world that was burning up and voluntarily died knowing it, but that he could save many, many more. Can you think of it, friends? We know what the wounds are like that we carry. Sometimes I think of humanity as like we're, we're, we're bundles walking around, bundles of shards of broken glass. And Jesus didn't keep arm's length from the dysfunction, the mess, the sorrow. Though he very justifiably could have. Ugh, yikes, stay away from me. I'm going back to heaven. But he comes down and he walks around Jerusalem. Walks around, walks toward that farce of a tribe. Walks toward the hill of Calvary, carrying his cross. And he gets up there and he bleeds for humanity. He blesses others while others are cursing him. He resists the mocking tones to save himself. He saved others, let him save himself. Oh, he could, Jesus could say. If you only knew, I could blow everybody away right now with a, I don't know, some kind of an outputting of spiritual force. But Jesus was willing to endure it all. He was eager, actually, to take the wounds of the cross, friends, so that you and I would not have to continue endlessly in our woundedness. We wouldn't have to live perpetually wounded, and we wouldn't have to die profoundly, unresolvedly wounded. We all choose what we decide to cling to and what we give to Jesus. The Bible urges us in Peter's first epistle to cast all our burdens, all our cares, all our anxieties on Jesus because he cares for us. And I can only imagine the prayers that went up that day. Prayers that went up from within the towers, within the plains, within the family members, and within the heroes. I think a lot of people were talking to God that day. Maybe there'll be a record. Maybe, you know, we put museums on the National Mall. I hope in heaven there's a record. I believe there's a record of every person who has prayed sincere prayers to God and who has heroically faced danger and evil for his sake. We can give our tears, our stresses, our burdens to Jesus, and in exchange, over time, receive laughter, joy, and rejoicing. He will take the difference. He will bear all wounds. But some still choose to deny no great controversy, no plan of salvation. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That is Paul's summary of those who how they live outside of salvation. Let's have the best time we can because who knows when the party's going to end. Friends, we know the party continues and continues. Amen? There are deniers of our communal societal wounds as well. There are Holocaust deniers out there. Deplorable. They are a minority. But as soon as that massive historical event, that six million friends, that dwarfs them. As soon as that massive historical event gets right over the generational horizon, there aren't many people living to testify of it. It's not staring you in the face anymore. People get wiggle room to say, it didn't happen, it didn't happen. We don't yet have that about 9-11. I pray that we don't. That's why we have the resolution to never forget. But we've had the conspiracy theorists. Do you remember that? It was an inside job from the government. To do what exactly? To get us to submit. Well, okay, it seems like an awfully high price. If somehow that did happen, 
They won't get away with anything. They will face God on judgment day. Amen? And the perpetrators will. And we need this, friend. There was no way to bring those perpetrators to justice because they died as well. God is their judge. Amen? And the universe will not be satisfied until all perpetrators of evil face God to not explain, not defend. These things are undefendable, unexplainable, but to face the reality and the consequence for what they've done. Make no mistake, the perpetrators will face God in the judgment for nine of them. We need the judgment both for our liberation and for justice of those who perpetuate great evil. But back to the better half of our salvation story. Praise the Lord. After enduring the pain, the weight, the burden of our sins, the excruciating separation from the Father, Praise the Lord. Jesus showed. If there was anything more miraculous than a perfect person dying for our sins, conquering the grave, amen, rising again, full of grace and truth, loveliness and beauty. And faithful witnesses recorded their accounts of his post-resurrection interactions. Peace be with you, Jesus said. Let not your hearts be troubled. One thing that is testified to in the scripture is that Jesus still bears the marks of the cross. Do you remember Jesus' conversation with Thomas the Doubter in John chapter 20? Look at my scars, Thomas. Come put your hands in my side and in my hands. See for yourself and believe. You believe because you have seen, Thomas. Blessed are those, you remember, who believe without seeing. Blessed are those who take Jesus' salvation and ingest it to become our own life now through which we discern and process all other blessings and tragedies, everything good and bad in life is processed through our understanding of this. Jesus' scars will continue to be the ultimate testimony of His love. They are the price that He paid to bring about our healing and our salvation. As we read from Isaiah 53 in the responsive reading, by His stripes we are healed. Paradoxical, isn't it? That wounds going on to somebody else can heal my wounds. I praise the Lord, though, for that paradox. And our scripture reading today from Zechariah 13, 6. One will say to him, What are these wounds in your hands? Then he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. We believe this is a prophecy of conversations that will be held in heaven perhaps on into the new world. Praise the Lord, we will bask in glory so long and so thoroughly that the memories of this earth will dim and fade. You remember the line of that song that we all And the things of earth will grow strangely in the light of His glory and grace. We will live so long and so thoroughly, dear friends, that this will seem like a nightmare from which we have wakened. Have you had distressing dreams sometimes? I had a couple this week. So glad to wake up from it, right? To come back to this reality. That is how heaven will seem, and the memories will grow dim, and at some point, and this could also happen early in our experience in heaven. It could happen from a child who passed away perhaps before hearing the gospel story. It could happen from a person who lived and died in a society where the gospel never reached them before they died. But as they're enjoying Jesus, as they're basking in the company of Him, they notice scars in their hands. And they say, what's that? What's, what's the scar in your hands? And He says, I received those when I went to visit my friends in the house of my friends. Jesus came to this world to befriend this world, to be called brother and friend. I praise the Lord that He doesn't hesitate to use those terms. But what do we do? A minority accepted Him, but the majority crucified Him, crucified Him gave him these wounds, and the wounds will endure. We will never, friends, and I'm so thankful, um, Nahum 1.9 says the rebellion will not come up a second time. I'm so thankful that we will never dip back into this period of the great controversy. Jesus' wounds will be a big part of the protection to never forget what the cost of sin is. Jesus' is own life. Amen? Now, if you read that whole chapter of Zechariah 13, it doesn't smack of like a prophecy of the new heavens and the new earth. You might say that verse is taken out of context, but I'll assure you, we have good precedent for that. Ellen White's writings, The Spirit of Prophecy, in a few places, talks about this verse in light of the future reality. 
Okay, I want to read you a short passage from Early Writings, page 179. Jesus will present his hands with the marks of his crucifixion, the marks of his cruelty he will ever bear. Every print of the nails will tell of the story of man's wonderful redemption and the dear price by which it was purchased. Amen, dear friends? So I think, in hindsight, over 20 years, I think um, the wound or the scars have enlarged large part healed. I myself can go a couple of weeks at this point without thinking of 9 11. Uh, families who had somebody who lost, who died in the towers, or military families who went over afterwards, they do not have the luxury of not thinking of it for a week or two. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I'm thankful for the tower that's south on the 57, that uh, firefighter training tower, it said that we will never forget it, September 11th. But this wound is starting to scar over, and in another couple generations, it will be but another story in the history books. It'll be like Pearl Harbor to those of us who are younger than when Pearl Harbor happened. We understand it was a big thing, but, you know, personal. It got us into World War II, which affected my family greatly. But, uh, but friends, all these wounds, praise the Lord, uh, twice in the book of Revelation. It says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Amen? And I do believe that that represents a profound healing. Wiping tears from eyes as if maybe they had never been shed in the first place. Yes? Our wounds will be healed. Off in eternity, 10,000, 10 billion years in the future, we may say, what kind of It's hard to imagine now. But Jesus' scars will be healed. Amen? By his wounds we are healed. I pray, dear, Lord, dear friends, that you would pass on all of your scars, all of your heartaches to Jesus. They still take time to process through. But give it all to Jesus. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn in which we resolve to come near the cross, to perceive our Savior's great sacrifice, but we also find our rest beyond the river. Let's sing that uh, glorious hymn number 312. We invite you to stand at your feet. You can either grab the hymnal out of the pew or we'll have the words on the screen. 312.
are so look forward to the profound and eternal rest that we will have in you. We see each Sabbath as a foreshadowing of it, dear Heavenly Father. I pray that all of our wounds, all of our burdens, all of our anxieties, Lord, sometimes they are a dull ache, sometimes they are an acute sting, Lord. But we want to give these to you, dear Jesus. Thank you for having offered to take these and to help us work through them and help us deal with them and eventually uh, wipe the tears as if we had never cried them. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I know we all go through our daily struggles. I know our society is going through anxiety and hardship just now. Lord. We need your rest. Please give us a dollop, a one percent taste of the rest that is beyond the river right now, dear Jesus. Pray a blessing on the remainder of our Sabbath hours and our Sabbath afternoon activities. Pray a blessing for each family here and those watching online. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. You're welcome to be seated. Thank you so much for having worshipped today. As usual, we will have a couple of deacons on the way out to give your tithes and your offerings. I believe uh, Brother Victor gave an appeal last week. Uh, please do remember the importance of local church offerings, as we do have many ministries to sustain human utilities. Uh, Brother Devin has prepared a post for us. Please stay in the sanctuary and enjoy that post. Afterwards, I'll be out in the courtyard to uh, speak with anybody afterwards. Don't forget, we've got prayer group right around the circle here. If you've got a prayer on your heart, don't leave without getting some good prayer from some brothers and sisters. God bless you all.